Uh, you know, it is really remarkable how um, these individuals are not only diverse, but I think the thing that many people miss is their unity and their unity of purpose. It's a term that I sort of, a phrase that I sort of come, came up with. They were, they were united. Um, they weren't just, it wasn't just a, you know, section of African Americans, et cetera. They were all together. And this teamwork was forged in the, in the Grand Banks, where these men had to live in close quarters under life and death situations, um, you know, at the mercy of the sea for years, extreme hardship, which put them together and welded them together. I mean, I think it's a great story for America. Hi, this is Tony Williams, a senior fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and welcome to another Scholar Talk. On this episode, we are honored to have a best-selling historian and scholar Patrick O'Donnell with us, and he's going to talk about his new book, The Indispensables, and I'll read the, the longish subtitle here, The Diverse Soldier Mariners Who Shaped the Country, Formed the Navy, and Rode Washington Across the Delaware. It seems like uh, some of my, my books uh, with, with longer subtitles. Well, the guiding question for today, for this conversation, is how did this diverse Marblehead Regiment contribute to the creation of American liberty and independence during the American Revolution? And how did the members of the regiment demonstrate the civic virtues of courage, perseverance, and equality? By way of introduction, Patrick O'Donnell is a historian, public speaker, and best-selling author of 12 books and scores of films and documentaries spanning from the American Revolution to the Battle of Fallujah. He is a leading expert on America's elite and special operations units, and his website is patrickkodonnell.com. Patrick, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for appearing. It's great to be with you, Tony, today. Yeah, thanks. You know, I, I just have to really uh, sing the praises of this book. It's, re it's really remarkable. And for a couple of reasons, one is I had wanted to write their story a couple of years <laughs> back. I mean, this really is a great story. I was, I was a little familiar with it, but you told it in just extraordinary, uh, compelling detail. Uh, and the way you wove it in, uh, the story of the regiment with the larger events of the, the early American Revolution, was was really compelling and and that's the beauty of of history is these just great stories and and telling a a lesser known sort of unknown story uh is really just a, a brilliant way uh to uh give us a lens into the american revolution and this diverse regiment so uh thank you for your book well thank uh, you tony i appreciate that yeah my my um and many you know i've I've written a total of 12 books so far, going on 13, and my books have largely been untold stories that tell a larger story. And in many cases, it's about elite units that are at kind of an inflection point in history or multiple inflection points where they're able to, they're in some cases the right Americans or individuals at the right time in history at the right place that really change the course of events. And that's certainly the case with the, uh, the indispensables or the Marblehead men. Great. Well, well, help us set the scene here for, for your book. Uh, these Marblehead men, uh, tell us, you know, about their town, the social milieu, especially during the resistance against Great Britain. And, uh, you know, what, why did you tell their story? The, um, I told the story because um, every book that I've ever written is a journey, but every book is also, has found me in one way or another. And, the Indispensables found me through another book, a best-selling book that I wrote. It's called The um, Washington's Immortals, which is on the Marylanders. And the Marylanders had sort of a relationship to some degree with the Marblehead men in the sense that they had uh, transported them across the East River first and then later at Trenton. Um, so there was a, a little bit of a connection there. And then it was my, um, my readers who I really value. Uh, you know, one time it was, I indirectly said, hey, I'm writing a book about a group of men that changed the course of 
the revolution. Oh, you're writing about Glover's Marblehead Men. Well, no, not quite, but uh, we're getting there. And then I had about 10 of those come at me from different directions. And it was, it was really kind of fate that said, you know, you've got to write about these men. In this book, The Indispensables is a band of brothers, if you will, um, sort of treatment about the main characters in the regiment, but also the town. And it's really uh, some of our unknown or little known founders, such as a main character in the book is Elbridge Gary, who's a mainspring of the early revolution. And then later um, in our, in our, during the constitution years, et cetera, it's a really important figure where republicanism and virtue um, play, you know, he's not only, he doesn't just believe it, he lives it. And he lives, um, you know, trying to take these sort of abstract ideas and put them into play. And he, his mentor is Samuel Adams. Um, and the two of them have a large, um, you know, a really oversized role in the early revolutionary years. And, you know, for the, for the Marblehead men, this is a town that's about 30 miles north of Boston. But during, uh, prior to the revolution, it was the second largest town in Massachusetts. Um, a great deal, a massive portion of the Massachusetts economy at the time came from cod fishing. And Marblehead was the, was, uh, the cod capital of North America, effectively. I mean, and fortunes were made on cod. It was harvesting or you know, fishing in the Grand Banks um, and then bringing it back and then selling it uh, in, 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 in the various trade routes and trading for things. And this made massive fortunes in Marblehead. Um, but, you know, Marblehead gets, is, uh, the, 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 the royal government is, interferes with Marblehead in many ways. And this causes a lot of tension, especially at the early stages. Um, this is many, many years before the revolution. And the, the opening scene of the Indispensables is, um, is the pit packet. And the pit packet is being boarded by the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy is not there to, you know, to say hello. They're there to, to basically kidnap everybody on board and impress them. And, and this is a big deal. You know, consider, you think about you having a life with a family and everything else and a really a great career, you're a sea captain. But no, but suddenly you're impressed and you're basically put into slavery and paid a pittance in the Royal Navy and you don't get let go effectively for the rest of your life. This is a major, major problem of interference. It, it really roils the town, it, it, it upsets the people, and then there's bureaucracy that's taking place. They're told that they can't do certain things and how that they trade, and it just continues to ratchet up. And, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of sort of current events that take place in this book. For instance, the town in 1773, 74, is hit by a virus, which divided, divides the town politically between those who are loyal to the crown and the patriots. And that, the effect of that is, just, is remarkable. They, they come with a potential solution of creating a vaccine hospital, like a, a hospital to vaccinate or inoculate the population. And um, it goes you know, basically very poorly. The, the loyalists in town enrage the mob, they burn the hospital to the ground, the people inside it, they, just, they torch boats. I mean, the houses of the main characters of this book are surrounded by an angry mob. It's really, you know, some extraordinary scenes which have a profound effect on Elbridge Gary and John Glover and the other main characters of this book. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and as mariners, as a, a town who, who lives by the sea, uh, most people don't really think of the importance of gunpowder uh, but in, in the American Revolution. But because they're mariners and, and they're trading all over the Atlantic, they're able to secure those supplies of gunpowder. Uh, but also, they engage in sort of some of the fighting uh, and, and resistance against General Gage uh, trying to disarm them and take away their, their arms. So tell us a little bit about- This is an extremely um, important point, uh, Tony, that I don't think many scholars have really um, captured, but all of the key events it, it, where the, the revolution switches from a political revolution 
to kinetic, they run through the marble headers in one way or another. They're either supplying the powder or they're, they're fighting, et cetera. But the, in, in 1774, 73, powder was the unum necessarium. It was the one thing that was so critical and they had none of it at all. It was, it was, it was incredibly scarce. And I mean, this, I have to emphasize this point, a single barrel, um, you know, a couple large cannon, that, that, they're power hogs. I mean, that, that it doesn't go far. And there was no organic production at all in the, in the colonies for the most part. Everything had to be imported. And there were a number of royal decrees that banned the importation. And the British recognized this. We had guns, but we didn't have power. And Gage specifically went on targeted operations to disarm Americans. And he knew that if he disarmed the American colonies, it would just be, um, there wouldn't be any kind of revolution at all. And it's the Marbleheaders that play a key role. The, the bulk of the powder at Lexington and Concord was, was um, obtained by the Marbleheaders. And they have a crucial contact that's really been forgotten in history in many ways. It's with a major trading house in Spain. And this um, relationship that they have for 20 to 30 years is what cements a foreign alliance with Spain that's really never been highlighted. And the Marbleheaders convert their fishing lines, their trading lines into military su supply routes at the early stages of the revolution and later on. And this powder is absolutely critical and essential. Right, and another really important role that plays, you point out in, in the book, is that they're the, help form the foundation of, of the US Navy and, and therefore American independence and nationhood. Uh, how, how do they do that? How are they this, is a, this is a really important story because the Navy is, begins as a fishing boat. I mean, that, it just seems sort of preposterous to think about it. A fishing boat is going to go after the mightiest navy in the world, but the U.S. Navy, now the mightiest navy in the world, has its very humble origins as John Glover's fishing boat, which General Washington, it's many, in many ways, it's Washington who's a, the primary driver and architect behind the navy. He recognizes that a navy is, is, is important because, hey, maybe we can capture one of those British supply ships that's loaded with powder. Um, if we can pick it off with a small, um, fast schooner that the, the Royal Navy might not be able to catch. And that's what he does. He basically um, authorizes John Glover and the Marblehead Regiment, who he forms an important bond at Cambridge, um, is where his headquarters is located. It's the Marblehead men that initially guard Washington at the Bassett House. And in this, they, they form a tight relationship, which also forms something else called the guard or the lifeguard. And it's the, um, this effectively the, the adjutant of the Marblehead Regiment that becomes the leader of the lifeguard and forms it and everything else and brings in several men. But the Navy starts in the summer of 1775 through Washington's orders to Glover to outfit the ship. And the ship is the Hannah. It's a rotting fishing tub that uh, Glover has, and they, he rents it to the United States um, for, you know, roughly 75, I think, pounds per month. And they outfit, they put the, uh, they, you know, carpenters come on, they, they, um, they put the holes in the side of the hull so that they can put cannons in there, and they outfit it as a vegetable war. And the early Navy story, Tony, is just extraordinary. It's a, um, it's not necessarily glorious, all the time, there's mutinies. There's they invade Canada with auto, uh, authorization. It's um, it's ex it's a very extraordinary and colorful story. Right. I, this is all just so so remarkable and so interesting. And but what what's also very dramatic is, is this point during the the Battle of New York, in which the the army has to escape from from Long Island over to Manhattan, and and otherwise would have been just completely lost in the Revolutionary War ends. And of course who appears at this American Dunkirk to save the day, the, the Marblehead Regiment. So, so tell us about that compelling moment. This is, this is um, 
sort of the, the, the way that I was able to, my introduction to, to, to Glover's men was at the Battle of Brooklyn where I wrote about Washington's Immortals, where they make an epic stand that's an hour more precious in our history than any other. That buys them time to retreat into the fortifications at Brooklyn Heights. The British have us surrounded. This is a point in our history where the entire revolution could come to an end um, by them um, crushing us, by attacking those forts. But a series of things take place. There's a nor'easter, um, which sets up some atmospherics. And Washington decides, rather than to stand and fight, to wisely evacuate. And he calls upon his most experienced mariners, the Marblehead men, to make that crossing. And it's, it, it, it's an incredible story. We are so lucky that it, it worked. <laughs> I mean, Glover and his, um, his men had zero time to prepare. They said, okay, here are the boats, make it happen. And they do it. They transport over 9,000 American troops in the dead of night, um, you know, across the swirling East River, which the tides, in multiple cases, they don't work. But the Mariners have something going for them. Not only are they diverse, but they've worked together as a team for years at the Grand Banks, the most dangerous waters in the world. And they're able to tackle this mission impossible. And then, of course, I mean, there's uh, a providential fog that sets in exactly at the right time and the right place to screen the movement of Glover's boats. The winds don't favor the British Navy, which could sail up the river and, and destroy our force at any time, but it doesn't happen. And the Marblehead men basically pull off a miracle, the American Dunkirk, and save the entire army and potentially the revolution. Right, and, and but wait, there's more. <laughs> there it is, it just doesn't end. I mean, these, they're in so many key inflection points. That's why I call them the indispensables. And it's not necessarily the things you think about. I mean, the, my favorite is the, the virus that hits the town that divides everybody politically which is bad, people die. But in the end, it's the training that saves Washington's army by inoculation through Dr. Bond. Right, and, and really, you know, Washington- An untold I, story that nobody has ever gotten into. Right, right, and, and so, uh, but perhaps their finest hour, Washington's finest hour, one of the finest hours of the American Revolution, to, to quote Churchill, in which the, the Marblehead men just demonstrate just remarkable courage and perseverance is, of course, Washington's crossing of the Delaware on this fateful night enables uh, him to win these great victories at Trenton and Princeton. And again, they're right at the center of it and, and make this, this great victory possible. Indeed, I, you can't, this is, uh, you know, uh, you couldn't, make this up but this is the true story that's just it's so extraordinary because this is our darkest days as a nation things are falling apart politically you know washington's army has sustained one disastrous defeat after another you know politically the times have turned and um time has turned and the times have turned because people are turning against the um the patriot cause and they're, they're basically signing up for pardons from Lord Howe. New Jersey is conquered. Winter is setting in. Uh, the economy is a disaster. It looks like it's hopeless. The biggest thing, too, is the enlistments are all about to expire. Washington's army is about to evaporate. So he makes a bold strike at Trenton to take out the, the outpost of, that's manned by the Hessians of Ro Johann Rall, who is an extremely experienced and able commander. Um, but that night they, they, they cross and the river is, is treacherous. It's, you know, it's ice filled. There's, there's snow and sleet. It's impassable for the other. This is an important point that a lot of people don't realize. There were several thrusts of, of Washington's army that attacked Trenton that day or that night and they failed. The only portion that, that succeeded were the, the boats that were manned by the Marblehead men because they were the only ones that had the skills to get it across. And they were able to cross the, the river and, um, and then attack Trenton. And, what, you know, the story doesn't end there. Trenton could have easily been a, a typical 
battle during the Revolutionary War where they engage each other and then they melt away. That's how it normally worked. But at Trenton, it was a, 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 a double envelop where they were able to envelop uh, Rawls Garrison. And it's because the Marblehead men captured Aspen Creek, uh, Creek Bridge, which was the crucial escape route for Rawls men had they wisely escaped after the first contact or a little bit of contact. But instead they stood and fought, but they stood and fought because they had no choice. That escape route was closed thanks to John Glover, who captured not only the bridge, but the high ground across in position cannon, so it was an impossible escape. Yeah, I, you know, I'm just always amazed as you point out now in, in the book, just that they got across the Delaware, they didn't lose a man, uh, they got horses across and, 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 and guns and, and all those, uh, man, it's just uh, under such dire conditions in this nor'easter and nice chunks through the river, uh, you know, the, the, the flow of their water must have just been torturous to, to get across, and, and yet they don't lose anyone. I mean, it's just so remarkable. And then they also, and I mean, this is another thing that I think people don't realize, is just the condition of the army. Many of these men had no shoes. There really was bloody footprints. I mean, just think about the sacrifice there of, of these Americans. It's just incredible. It's awe-inspiring. Right. And, you know, what's also really awe-inspiring um, is something we haven't tapped into yet. Uh, exactly who comprised this, this regiment uh, from Marblehead, because it really showed remarkable diversity for the time across social classes, uh, whites of all social classes. There were free blacks in the regiment. Uh, there were Native Americans. And so my last question is, how does that diversity, uh, how does it become a source of strength that helps win American independence and, and really provide a great model for the future? I, you know, it is really remarkable how um, these individuals are not only diverse, but I think the thing that many people miss is their unity and their unity of purpose. It's a term that I sort of, a phrase that I sort of come, came up with. They were, they were united. Um, they weren't just, it wasn't just a, you know, section of African Americans, etc. They were all together. And this teamwork, was forged in the, in the Grand Banks, where these men had to live in close quarters under life and death situations, um, you know, at the mercy of the sea for years, extreme hardship, which put them together and welded them together. I mean, I think it's a great story for America in many ways, because it's about, instead of, it, it's, they, they were greater than, you know, their parts, so to speak, the, the, the whole was greater than the sum of the, of the you know, the, they, they, that's an extraordinary story in and of itself of how we, how those individuals work together um, as a, a unified team to overcome the, you know, greatest army at the world at the time, the greatest Navy, and then also uh, an unforgiving environment in many cases, um, an economy that was just horrendous, um, you know, where they're, they were starving in Marblehead after the, as the war was progressing. And I capture the stories of the women there that literally go on a food riot, which is sort of a, a bit of a, um, an unknown story as well. Um, there's, there's so many aspects to it that, I, you know, that are really quite extraordinary and then also um, important, I think, to, to today. Patrick O'Donnell, uh, the new book is The Indispensables. Congratulations, and, and thank you for sharing that uh, tremendous story with us today. It's been an honor to be with you today. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate it. If you like this episode of Scholar Talks, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and offer your comments below. We offer new content every Tuesday and Thursday, including Scholar Talks like this one. Uh, homework help videos for students, and primary source close reads. And please be sure to join our conversation on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and see the ways that you can get involved with BRI. Thank you.